TSA takedowns, what's driving a spike in attacks on the men and women who keep us safe at our nation's airports. Is it demolition time for Wapato? The permit we just obtained suggesting that may be the plan for the controversial jail. And Sessions is out. With the U.S. Attorney General now fired by President Trump, we take a look at the man slated to take his place and oversee the Mueller investigation. Plus, did your mail-in ballot end up back in your mailbox? We verify whether your vote actually counted. We talk about a photo bomb. How the Democratic Socialists of America crashed last night's Blazers game. I'll be honest, I was uh, pretty nervous. KGW News at 6 starts now. Travelers losing their cool in the security line. It is happening a lot, and in some cases, it gets violent. Good evening, I'm Laurel Porter. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dan Haggerty. Now, most of us know you don't really mess around when you're going through those TSA lines at the airport. Security is pretty serious, but a new KGW investigation finding now a pretty alarming number of assaults against those airport screeners, many of them caught on camera. KGW investigative report Kyle Aboshi uh, talked to the experts here about what's driving what apparently is kind of a trend. Right. Well, when we say assault, we're not talking about somebody just mouthing off to the TSA. Often these are violent physical attacks against airport screeners. August 20th, 2017, Portland International Airport. A passenger going through airport security becomes agitated and confronts a female TSA officer. Moments later, the exchange gets physical and fellow passengers rush to intervene. But the man doesn't stop there. Surrounded by a group of airport screeners, the passenger becomes violent once again. This time assaulting a male TSA officer before the passenger is brought to the ground. Nationwide, the TSA reports screeners were physically assaulted 34 times last year, up from 26 in 2016. That's a 31% increase. And those numbers may be low, says the union representing airport screeners because many confrontations go unreported. It is not just physical, there's verbal abuse of the TSA officers on a regular reoccurring basis. Attacks on TSA workers have occurred at airports around the country. It's not clear why the sudden increase, although the TSA union suggests staffing levels could be a factor. There are less officers, which frequently causes lower morale, causes lines to be longer at airports, uh, and therefore people get frustrated because they are in lines longer. An internal TSA study found in 2017, more than half of the assaults happened during a pat-down or bag check. And in most cases, the aggressor was male, aged 41 to 50. I have had a couple, certainly I know of that couple who have been verbal, verbally confrontational with me, yeah. TSA officer Greg Beal admits confrontations are rare. At PDX, tens of thousands of travelers pass through security every day without incident. But if a passenger does become violent, he'd like to have a uniformed police officer standing by at every security checkpoint as an extra layer of protection. That is, I think, one of the big things that's really kind of missing. In several cases, like this 2013 attack on a TSA worker at Honolulu International Airport, fellow passengers were the first to intervene, not local police. And in the Portland incidents, surveillance video shows it took two minutes for an armed Port of Portland officer to arrive. When those events do take place, there, there's a lapse in time before the authorities are able to respond to the location. That should be instant. Earlier this year, the TSA created a secret watch list of threatening and unruly travelers. The Committee on Homeland An agency Security administrator testified before a House subcommittee in May. There are less than 50 people on this list, and the intent was we were seeing an, an alarming increase in the number of assaults against our officers. For passengers who lose their cool, there are consequences. In Portland, 45-year-old Anthony Tavolini was sentenced to three years of probation, including three months of home detention, for assaulting a pair of TSA officers. 
The union representing TSA officers says this is an example why there needs to be more airport screeners. The union is concerned that money from the agency is being stripped away at a time when those officers need more reinforcements. You have so many people going through uh, the security there. I'm sure the inspiration for these outbursts are always different. Um, but they face them regularly. Indeed, they do. And uh, as you saw there, oftentimes very violent passengers. Wow. And that's challenging. You Thank bet. you, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Kyle, appreciate it. Meanwhile, if you have a story idea for Kyle for the investigative team, give him a call, 503-226-5041, or you can email callkyle at kgw.com. It was built to be a jail, but never used. Then the community talked about turning it into a homeless shelter. Now the future of Wapato has taken yet another turn as the new owners filed a permit to tear it down. Yeah, it looks like that's what's going to happen, at least from now. Uh, new owner Jordan Schnitzer filed a permit for demolition inspections. They say have already begun here. This is a bit of a shock to a lot of people who is recently really is this week. We're thinking this facility could be used to help uh, shelter some of the homeless. Wapato, if you remember, cost a lot of money, cost taxpayers $58 million to build this in 2004, but it was never used as a jail. Uh, earlier this year, the county sold the facility for just $5 million, a fraction of its $58 million price tag. The page is barely turned on last night's midterm election, but the White House today entered attack mode quickly after some of the races settled. So we know the Republicans kept control of the Senate. They did lose uh, in the House. Meantime, Democrats now have subpoena power over the president's financial history, something that he has kept private. We'll see what happens there. Still some of the results coming in right now, including Herrera Butler and Long, that congressional race in southwest Washington. As it stands, Democrats right now have taken 27 House seats from the Republicans. Republicans gained at least two seats in the Senate. Both President Trump and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi declared some kind of victory in all of this. And Pelosi says she does expect to be elected speaker which will be the second time for her. Let me just say this in one sentence. I heard the president say I deserve to be the speaker. I don't think anybody deserves anything. It's not about what you have done. It's what you can do. What you have done in the past speaks to your credentials, but it's about what you can do. And I think I'm the best person to go forward uh, to unify, uh, to negotiate. I'm, I'm, I'm a good negotiator. At 630, we're going to have a lot more on the national politics, including some information from the president's intense news conference today, which resulted in the White House, a White House reporter losing his press credentials. Okay. That's coming up. You don't want to miss that. In our local races, Joanne Hardesty became the first African-American woman voted on to Portland City Council. She won a solid victory over Loretta Smith. KGW's Brian Brennan joins us live after speaking to Hardesty one on one. And Brian, she has a lot of plans. That's right. You know, she's ready to start in January. She has plans for day one and her supporters say she's going to shake things up. Cheers, music and dancing. Joanne Hardesty won big on Election Day. She became the first African-American woman on Portland City Council. It's a very humbling uh, position to be in. Uh, it comes with a big weight, um, but it also comes with wonderful opportunity. I want little black and brown girls to look up at the city council and say, oh, I could be on a city council one day. Hardesty has been on the public stage in Portland and Oregon for nearly 30 years. She's been a state representative, a policy advisor, and an advocate of a dozen groups. She is also the former president of the NAACP Portland chapter. The current president says he knows exactly what Hardesty will do on city council. To shake it up <laughs> and make some noise. Hardesty says her big win was a mandate to do just that. That's what the people want. That's what the people voted for. She says the city council needs to make changes. What we need is an elected leader that says that Joy uh, Gibson uh, and the Proud Boys and any other white supremacists that want to come to Portland aren't welcome. That's what we need. And so I'll, I'll make that statement it's the day I'm sworn in. Hardesty says she didn't mean to forget Mayor Wheeler's name when addressing her crowd last night. Hey, Mayor, uh, what's his name? But she's not afraid to speak up for groups that need to be heard. He did an excellent job at the county. I think he's doing not as good a job as he could at the city, but I'm going to be there to help him. Hardesty also puts women in the majority on Portland City Council for the first time. 
back to you. It's a huge midterm for women running for office, and uh, we see it right here at home. Thank you so much for that report. Uh, there was another big winner in last night's election, a clean energy fund for Portland. KGW's environmental reporter, Keely Chalmers, talked to the backers of this measure today. Keely, they call this a win for all the people in Portland. Yeah, that's right. And that's because this measure means more projects like this solar energy one here behind me popping up around the city of Portland, especially in the communities that could really benefit from this kind of help. That's my jewel. Linda Dentler is talking about her heat pump. She calls it a lifesaver, along with her new energy efficient windows. These are all double pane windows. And crawl space insulation. I went from disliking my house to loving my house. Thanks to a Multnomah County program, Dentler was able to weatherize her Northeast Portland mobile home last year, saving her hundreds of dollars every month. I went from $300 a month for electricity now my top bill has been 75, but it's running near 40. Now the city of Portland will be able to help others do the same, thanks to the clean energy tax just passed by voters. The measure levies a 1% tax on large businesses, specifically businesses that make over $1 billion in revenue nationally and $500,000 locally. These are businesses like Comcast, Ikea, or Walmart, although the tax does not apply to groceries or healthcare service companies. Today this measure creates a new resource for energy efficiency, renewable energy investments in low-income people of color communities. Backers estimate the tax would raise about $30 million a year. Organizations and nonprofits could then apply to use that money on various clean energy projects in the city, like, for example, new neighborhood solar arrays or community-wide weatherization projects. For low-income Portlanders who are struggling to make ends meet, one of the biggest bills they face on a monthly basis is their utility bill. Oh, I think it's great. Dentler calls it a win for the environment, for her community, and for the city of Portland. I'd love to see solar panels on every place and knowing that Mother Nature is smiling. Now the city will appoint a special committee to run the program and allocate the funds. We're told those funds could be available as early as next year.